Game of Thrones. It's perhaps one of the most popular TV series of all time. The TV series has received much attention in the past few years, pulling huge audiences through its unique set of storylines and characters. But it is slowly drawing to its conclusion, and with only two seasons left, we thought why not talk about the amazing characters, places and events that may be similar to our own past. George R. R. Martin has drawn on many aspects of real world history to influence his writings, and we're here today to talk about some of these possible inspirations. Obviously this is a fantasy universe, which will not perfectly match our own world, but it's certainly exciting to talk about. Of course there were no dragons or ice zombies within our own past, however we can make many comparisons within the world of Game of Thrones to our own history. As some of you will know, much of Game of Thrones is based on the War of the Roses, a period within English history where the houses of York and Lancaster duped out to sit on the English throne. Many characters from the War of the Roses can correlate to Game of Thrones. Cersei Lannister can be compared to the real life Margaret of Anjou. Both ruthless, powerful women gripped on staying in power, who were both married off to create a political alliance. Both of them battled rumours about the legitimacy of their children, and both had a violent son. Eddard Stark was a man of honour, justice and rather good with a sword during Robert's rebellion. This character may have been inspired by Richard, Duke of York, who became Lord Protector for King Henry VI in the 15th century. After many battles in the Hundred Years War, Richard began to have disagreements with Henry's wife, Margaret of Anjou, as Ned Stark did with Cersei Lannister. Eddard and Richard ultimately ended up with their heads mounted on spikes, with their children marching for revenge. Rob Stark and Theon Greyjoy were raised like brothers, However, during the War of the Five Kings, Theon betrayed Rob to gain the admiration of his natural father Balon. Much like Theon, George Duke of Clarence betrayed his brother Edward IV to align with his father-in-law during the War of the Roses. Just like Rob Stark, Edward IV backed out of an arranged marriage with a French princess and married Elizabeth Woodville. This angered his closest ally, the Earl of Warwick, and just like Walder Frey, rebelled against him. Although. Edward didn't die gruesomely at a wedding. The wedding was actually inspired by the Black Dinner and the Glencoe Massacre, two dark events within Scotland's medieval history. During season 3, Brandon and Rickon Stark escaped Winterfell after it was captured by Theon Greyjoy, and no one could find them for a long time. This is rather similar to the story of the two princes in the tower, where the two princes of Edward IV mysteriously disappeared and were never heard of again. But Bran may have also been inspired by Nostradamus in that he can look into the future. Nostradamus was a French physician who in the 16th century recorded events yet to happen, and supposedly predicted events such as the rise of Hitler, 9-11 and the Great Fire of London. Outside the War of the Roses we can find Gottfried von Berlichingen, a German imperial knight born into a noble family in the 16th century, who may have inspired Jaime Lannister's greatest event, so far. Jamie lost his hand and it was replaced with a golden hand, and just like Jamie, Gottfried lost his hand except it was due to an enemy cannonball and his new hand was only made out of iron. Viserys Targaryen had one of the most dramatic and painful deaths on the show, with molten gold being poured over him. This scene may have been inspired by the death of Inolchuk, an enemy of Genghis Khan in 1219. Inolchuk's fate came to an abrupt end when he was captured and executed, having molten silver poured into his eyes and ears. But what about some of the groups we see on the show? The Dothraki can closely resemble the Mongols and Huns, riders on horseback that brought fear into the minds of enemies. The Unsullied were taken as children and trained as ultimate slave soldiers, much like the Spartans and the Mamelukes in our timeline. The Brotherhood Without Banners could have been influenced by Robin Hood and his Merry Men, though Robin Hood probably wasn't real himself. The Faceless Men can closely resemble the Persian Hashashin, an assassination group in the 13th century. Just like the Faceless Men, the Persian assassins were known to execute high level political killings while remaining anonymous, and were also able to change appearances and life stories to get closer to their targets. No target was too powerful or weak, and the deed could be done if the price was right. They weren't however religious. The Faceless Men worship the Many-Faced God, and in the world of Game of Thrones we can find many religions, some possibly inspired by our own. In the world of Westeros there is undoubtedly one iconic feature we cannot ignore, 
The Wall. At 700 feet high, 300 miles long, the wall was built by the first men 8,000 years ago and infused with magic to defend against the White Walkers. It's still defended by the Night's Watch and stood as a weak border defence against the wildlings and coming White Walkers. This was most likely inspired by Hadrian's Wall, located in the north of England. Built by the Romans in the 2nd century, it runs along the country for 74 miles at 15 feet high and defended the frontiers from a tribe at the time known as the Picts. In the first episode of Game of Thrones, we hear that direwolves are only found north of the Wall. Direwolves did actually exist thousands of years ago, but became extinct. We may not have any direwolves alive today, but we do have deerhounds, which originate from Scotland, north of the Wall. So could deerhounds be the direwolves of Game of Thrones? Heading south, we find the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros, the Kingdom of the North, the Kingdom of the Mountain and the Vale, the Kingdom of the Isle and the Rivers, the Kingdom of the Rock, the Kingdom of the Reach, the Kingdom of the Stormlands, and the Principality of Dawn. These can all be linked to the seven Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of England, known as the Heptarchy period. We can see similarities between the Anglo-Saxons, who travelled across the sea to control most of the lands from the Celts, and the Andals of Westeros, who came over and defeated the First Men, establishing a coexistence. Likewise, the Normans won in the Norman Conquest, and the Targaryens conquered Westeros, only having to secure Dawn by diplomacy later on. The land of Westeros is described in A Song of Ice and Fire as a giant continent, with Essos, another continent, being separated by the sea. Although we can compare Westeros to Britain in many ways, if we look at the geography of Westeros, we can see similarities with the geography of Europe. The Vale is rather mountainous, and just like Switzerland, the region often stayed out of European warfare, unlike medieval Germany who often suffered as the result of warfare. So Germany could be seen as the Riverlands, given all its rivers. The Westerlands is a region rich in gold, much like England was in Roman Britain, known for its large amounts of copper, gold, iron, lead, silver, and tin. The Kingdom of the Reach can be seen as France, with its rich climate for growing food. Dawn is similar to medieval Spain, with its intense heat and comparable culture and swords. The Iron Islands, while well, you could say that's been influenced by Norway and other Scandinavian nations with their rocky lands and Viking history. It's rather difficult to pinpoint the North and the Stormlands. Scotland could be the North given its wall, but it's not so cold. We could head over to Essos where there are elements of ancient Mesopotamia within Astapor and Marine. Old Valyria as ancient Greece or Rome, and Yunkai as Egypt. Ancient and glorious is Yunkai. Our empire was old before dragons stirred in old Valyria. Bravos is another key location within a Game of Thrones, and we can see elements of Venice, Florence, Genoa, and mixture of Italian city-states, with their shrewd merchants and mercenaries. Within the world of A Song of Ice and Fire are many forms of powerful weapons, which a fantasy epic should have. One of these greatest weapons, of course, is a Valyrian steel sword. How to make it has been lost to time, and only a few smiths know how to reforge it. It's so powerful, Brienne is even able to break another sword. This is most similar to Damascus steel, forged in South India before the Common Era. It was primarily used to make long-bladed weapons, which were reputed to be tough and shatter-resistant. It was believed that a blade made of Damascus steel could effortlessly cut through a rifle barrel, and the original method of production has been lost. During Season 2, Tyrion learned about the deadliest weapon in Westeros. I remember reading an old sailor's proverb. Piss on wildfire and your cock burns off. This weapon of mass destruction was used to obliterate Stannis Baratheon's fleet during the Battle of Blackwater, and can compare to the real-world Greek fire, which was used by the Byzantine Empire against the oncoming Arab fleet. Greek fire was a weapon similar to wildfire, in that it set ablaze to the Arab fleet, and sent them running back home. And just like wildfire, it was a closely guarded secret. Undoubtedly, there are many more comparisons from our world to a Game of Thrones, probably too many to count, 